Well, hello, family. Today, I have a very special guest to help us with some historical insight that will help us understand why the world is in the shape that it's in. Jay Dyer is with us today. Jay is the host of Jay's Analysis Podcast in Esoteric Hollywood. He is an academically published author of peer-reviewed works. He has appeared on numerous nationally syndicated radio shows such as Ground Zero and Coast to Coast AM. He's the author of Esoteric Hollywood, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film. Jay's specialties include not only theology and geopolitics, but also metaphysics, film analysis, literature, authentic history, and more. Thank you so much, Jay, for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Dan. I'm glad to be here. It's a pleasure. Uh, I'm, I'm always honored when people ask me on their channel. So I look forward to talking about technocracy. It's definitely something that I've put a lot of time into. Um, I'll, I'm also the host, co-host now of Worski Live, which is a pretty large uh, YouTube channel that deals with kind of Joe Rogan style interviews. But uh, we also talk uh, conspiracy and uh, geopolitics and all kinds of movie symbolism and whatnot. Oh, fantastic. Well, these, <clears throat> these subjects are so huge and the truth right. of our history has been so altered and hidden from us. And very few people have the bandwidth, honestly, to do such a deep study to get to the bottom of things, which is what it really takes to comprehend how deep these agendas of control really go, which is why people like you who have already spent so many years uh, reading their own works and staying afloat of what they're doing, so very valuable, very few of us are able to do that. We're dealing with what the beast is keeping us all busy, you know, keeping our heads afloat. So thanks right. for all your work and the good that you do for us all. But regarding the importance of you know, the elites and their own works. Um, in my own journey, it was by reading Zbigniew Brzezinski's work, Between Two Ages, America's Role in the Technocratic Era, that it became apparent to me that certain elites are almost shameless in admitting, you know, their plans for controlling the planet. And on one hand for that, I am very grateful, but it was his work in the 70s it was already explaining in such great detail how this control through technocracy will turn out. Mm -hmm. And he was talking about the internet, about how people will voluntarily give their most private information, uh, which is evident in the lives of Facebook. Here's my, you know, creme brulee I had for dinner and, and much more. So just to back it up, most aren't even familiar with the word technocracy. So while we see the effects of it, we don't know how it came about. So if you wouldn't mind, please, uh, explain to us the, de the definition of technocracy and a little bit about its beginnings and how it got a reboot with Mr. Zbig. Yeah, this was actually, it's an idea that goes back to the ancient Greeks. So when I did my graduate and undergraduate work, I focused on philosophy, in particular ancient and medieval philosophy. And the idea of both cybernetics and technocracy arise from Plato. And this is mentioned in his writings. He, he conceives of the idea of techne or uh, the idea of uh, control through technology. Now, he doesn't believe in like computers per se, but he believes in the idea of mechanization. So this has been in ancient texts for a long time, but we have to come up to the period of the Enlightenment and the French Revolution. And you had writers like Henri Saint-Simon, uh, who was a guy who influenced Auguste Comte, and they actually invented sociology. So sociology actually comes out of a bunch of guys who also believe in the idea of technocracy, that you could basically create a completely controlled managerial society. So bound up with the idea of technocracy is the idea of controlling everyone through mechanization in some way, or coming up with a perfectly mathematical formula for how to run government and everyone else's lives in a very intrusive sense. So in the 30s, a guy picked up this idea who was an engineer named Howard Scott, and he kind of started what would become the modern technocracy movement. It didn't really catch on, it kind of died out, but what's ironic about his movement is that he titled it uh, Industrial Management, and he, and he meant, uh, in, in terms of, he called it Industrial Democracy, which is very bizarre because there's nothing democratic about technocracy at all. <laughs> so it's almost like a, a, a ruse in the name itself, he was duping everybody in the, with the name. Um, like I said, it, it kind of lost popularity. And then it became more popular once again, uh, I think particularly through the science fiction writings of people like H.G. Wells, certain uh, thinkers like Bertrand Russell, uh, who's a very important globalist strategist from about 100 years ago, a, a famous logician. 
uh, I cover his books in my series. Uh, and he was very high up on the pyramid. He was a member of the Royal Society, but he was very much a fan of, of technocracy as well as George Bernard Shaw, other people in the Royal Society. Um, and then when we come to the more modern period, we have, like you said, Brzezinski. Brzezinski was spotted by David Rockefeller as a potential technocrat, a potential person to be of influence. And he went for, to McGill University, which is interesting because McGill is one of the central universities for MK Ultra. So I don't know if there's a necessarily a direct connect between uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski and MK Ultra, but certainly he was aware of it and he attended you know, one of the central schools that was involved in those programs for government mind control, essentially, if you're not familiar with it. So anyway, Brzezinski picked up this idea. He was a fan of the technocrats. He felt like a managerial controlled society was the best way to go. So like, as you mentioned, in between two ages, he mentions the idea of Skype. He mentions the idea of everybody learning through the computer systems, not going to actual universities, but getting your online degrees. He mentions the fact that people will forget the news from two weeks ago and that the, the media will do the thinking for the public. And he thinks that's all great. He thinks that's a good thing. The most amazing thing that he mentions in that book in Between Two Ages is the concept of weather warfare and ELF and VLF magnetic manipulation of the atmosphere uh, and the human biosphere through giant ELF towers. So basically weather control is mentioned explicitly in Between Two Ages. I mean, I've got it right here so I can, I can show you the footnotes, but uh, but that's why David Rockefeller chose the big new Brzezinski to, to play this central role and placed him in the early 70s, right after this book came out, at the head of a new organization called the Trilateral Commission, which would be a kind of higher level committee above the Council on Foreign Relations, which is another Rockefeller creation. So basically, we have one of the key deep state agents in the figure of Brzezinski. And as you said, he is, in a, in a way, the father figure of modern technocracy. Wow, that's amazing. I didn't realize that um, they were above the CFR. That's new to me. And also, I didn't realize that this had been going on so very long. That's incredible. Because I, when I think about the control of the elites, I think of them sort of in, a, I guess, a little more modern time when they're like, oh, the population of the world is getting too crazy. We got to do something to scale this back and more of a, a new thing. And so that they make sure the only people that are around are the ones that are serving them. So uh, grasping it sort of intellectually is one thing, but what is it in, the, in your opinion that, that you would say as a description of what would be the fully realized technocratic plan as it would look in our world today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, one of the things that I write about a lot is Hollywood and science fiction and propaganda through fiction. So my book, Esoteric Hollywood, covers that in depth. I think it's about 363 pages, 404 footnotes just on this topic. There's a giant section devoted to H.G. Wells. We can't ever overlook H.G. Wells in a discussion of this, of this nature because he's seminal in influencing Hollywood and science fiction from his life on. So we think of The Island of Dr. Moreau. We think of War of the Worlds. We think of uh, uh, The Time Machine, all of these classic H.G. Uh, Wells stories. And H.G. Wells consistently put into his novels that he was a technocrat. So he wrote this book uh, in the 30s called The Shape of Things to Come. And in that, he predicted a giant world war. So in other words, he's predicting World War II. And he's only, he was only off by one year. Uh, and he said it would happen in about 10 years. And it would be one of the catalysts to take the world into believing that we need a, a giant global government and that's the only way to solve our problems and our disputes. So the, the, the giant wars that were concocted, I believe, by powerful banking interests, this is what Dr. Carol Quigley describes in his uh, uh, magnum opus called Tragedy and Hope. And he's also a technocrat. He's also in the school of Brzezinski uh, coming out of this same, this same mindset. Um, so H.G. Wells, uh, in his science fiction, gives us the image of what the technocracy will look like. And he even wrote this into, like I said, a fictional story called The Shape of Things to Come, which became a movie that presents basically a Brave New World 1984 scenario. And that's where we're going to go. So if you think about the dystopian stories uh, of Brave New World or 1984, and if you look on YouTube, you can find this old H.G. Wells movie. Uh, and it gives you this idea of a completely controlled society where everything is tracked and traced, everything is stored in AI. Basically, AI will run your life and tell you what you can and can't do when you've, you've used too much 
uh, toothpaste, uh, when you've, uh, you know, you've not had your daily big pharma pills for the day, you know, when you haven't watched the appropriate amount of porn that the system wants you to watch. When you, so it's all the stuff that they will have reg, regulated and regimented for your daily life. It'll be completely controlled, completely surveilled. Um, and essentially they will decide when people live or die. So it's, it's also a death state. It's also a euthanasia state where uh, there's, there's determinations made basis on the basis of uh, sustainable development, as it's so-called, uh, on, on how long you'll live before you're taking up too much energy and carbon. So it's a completely tyrannical system. We've seen actually many think tanks, many government organizations that are, that are self-consciously global have put out uh, videos, have put out white papers, have put out books, countless uh, aspects of propaganda telling us exactly what, what the the situation will be in a technocracy, but we're looking at something like out of a science fiction story, basically. Which means Black Mirror is not too far off, is he? <laughs> and that guy. Yeah, I, I mean, that's why I chose to actually do an analysis of every single episode of Black Mirror. Uh, yeah, so I, I saw really that. Long, like 20 page essay that I did because like you said, I saw that, you know, they're, they're really conditioning us through something like Black Mirror, especially. Yeah, at first, I wanted to think of his work as a warning. But as it kept going on, it felt more like pre pre programming and sort of like softening us to the idea. It's sort of like those old cop shows in the 80s. I mean, whatever, 90s. I noticed that they were doing things like searching people's houses without warrants and you know they're doing things that don't really fall under what the law is meant to be so that we become accustomed to it happening in a part of our really real world and for sadly for a lot of people they they're living in these shows and um so it's it's slowly breaking down it's slowly conditioning us to accept it yeah there's all kinds of examples of this there's old episodes of the rockford files that talk about the nsa storing information on every american that was back in like the late 70s early 80s wow. so yeah so again a big part of what i do is research fiction and, and movies and, and pull out these presaging predicting elements that really try to condition us like you said and certainly one of the greatest uh, attempts at conditioning that Hollywood has put forward is, is technocracy. They, they really want us to go into accepting transhumanism, which was coined by the Huxleys. So when you read Brave New World or when you see that, that kind of a dystopian scenario, um, you're not just looking at a guy who wants to warn everybody. I mean, Aldous Huxley was, was self-consciously a part of this globalist elite, being very open about it. Uh, and the book is a is a plan. It's a game plan. In fact, if you read the introduction of Brave New World, he says that this is the culmination of all the revolutions, all the way back to the French Revolution. So, if you if you recall, I mentioned at the beginning of, the, of this of this talk, the French Revolution is what gave us the idea of technocracy in the modern sense, with Henri Saint Simon, and then later in France, Auguste Comte. They create sociology. They create the idea of a technocratic society. And so that it's, it's, there's only one strand of ideology here and, and technocracy uh, and transhumanism sums it up. Well, I was glad that you mentioned that earlier about the carbon aspect of this, because it seems to me that that's the United Nations sort of linchpin yep. in how they'll call for um, complete control. And of course it will be to save the planet and um, it seems like maybe they grabbed hold of Brzezinski because he already had the technocracy piece. But as it ties into the United Nations, it just seems so flawless. So uh, what United Nations agenda goals that you're aware of um, pair well with technocracy to make it such a good fit? Or which came first? I mean, did they, did they just adopt the roles of the technocracy model um, into the UN or do you know? It's all synonymous because uh, you, you get UNESCO from the Huxleys as well. So the United Nations attempt to kind of co-opt and alter culture. This is straight out of the mind of the Huxleys. Um, it's all the same people. I mean, it's the same power structure, the, the Royal Society that created the, the Council on Foreign Relations in the, in the U.S., which is modeled on the U.K. roundtables. Uh, the roundtables come from Rothschild and Cecil Rhodes back to the period when they were trying to set up the best way of, of uh, managing the British Empire. So what we got in the U.S. is basically the same kind of model, and this is covered in uh, Dr. Carol Quigley's book, uh, The Anglo-American Establishment, which I also have two lectures on, a separate book from Tragedy and Hope. And they are the ones who come up with the idea of the U.N., well, first the League of Nations and then the U.N., and the, the idea here is to control the world through 
all areas of life. Again, it's, it's a total biosphere alteration and control. So it's not just like making sure that everything about you is tracked and traced and they know everything you've done. It's also a matter of manipulating and altering life itself. So when you talk about carbon taxing or, or controlling carbon, this is really just an aspect of, of population control, which is central to this whole plan. Um, life is carbon. We're carbon-based life forms. So when they talk about taxing carbon, really they just mean euthanasia. They just mean making sure that wow. uh, most of the population is dead. Georgia Guidestones keep the population down to 500 million. Uh, that's the root root of it. It's all It all centers around this. It's all based around the Luciferian aspect of Darwinism, which is something that I critique and debate often, uh, the notion of, of Darwinism. Um, and so it's all it, it's not that one necessarily preceded the other. They're all kind of kind of go go hand in hand because the same guys that formulated technocracy believed that that as a result there's only one way to govern men and thus it follows in their mind that it should be it should be global government wow so true um and i'm hoping that the type of people that watch my show are not going to be thinking this way and are already question the actions of the un but you know um the way that they you know, make it sound, of course, sounds very appealing. You know, we're going to make sure yep. that we save the environment. We're going to make sure that everyone has fair treatment. I mean, it sounds great, you know, but um, I guess what I would love to hear your sort of slant on is what facts would you point to people to warn against the UN agendas to those who see it's just a good thing. You know, we're just trying to save the earth and, and that sort of thing. Well, the two most obvious things that come to mind is everyone could just look up the Club of Rome document, uh, the first global revolution, and this came out in, this, in the 70s, well, there was a 70s version, and they kind of redid it in the 90s. And this is where in the text, they actually admit, I have an article exposing this, but they actually admit that they created the notion of pollution as a way to convince the world that mankind's problems are the result of too many people. So this is admitted in the document. It's completely fabricated. Um, not to say that there's not periods or times when pollution can be a problem, certainly, but that's not the root of man's problems. Uh, this is, again, part of their, their uh, depopulation agenda. And if you read something like David Rockefeller's memoirs, or if you read the authorized biography of the Rockefellers about Collier and Horowitz, they will discuss uh, depopulation at length. So it's very open about it. It's not, uh, it's not a mystery. Bill Gates, you know, he's involved in the same type of stuff. He talks about it openly in TED Talks. Um, Through vaccines. <laughs> yeah, and then the other thing. I think he slipped up on that one. What do you think? I mean, it almost seemed like an error on his part when he. Like they also like to throw it in people's faces at times too, so it could be either one. But uh, another way to see this is that if you look at what the UN pr uh, promotes in terms of UNESCO, which is a, a part of its propaganda arm, um, the ideas of you know the, the transgenderism and basically uh, messing up kids psychosexually. Uh, this is something that the UN, UN promotes globally. So there are two easy examples right away that, that let you know that the UN is not here to fix humanity. They're here to uh, technocratically control it and enact a, a big scale euthanasia operation. Oh, yes, sad but true. So we already covered what my next question was going to be about how you do agree that the carbon tax will be a major factor in this plan. I mean, do you have any you have any off the cuff i mean you're not exactly a scientist but you study so much you you know more than <laughs> what most scientists know because they're reading all the bunk all the bunk science but um do you have any um thing that you've come across that that proves that's bunk that their that their theories about carbon being the problem um is not actually true well there have been plenty plenty of good documentaries that discuss this a kind of a critique and exposing global warming as a propaganda thing i mean one thing that that comes to mind that's really easy to debunk it is the fact that uh it bears all the marks of a pr campaign so for example in the 80s when i was a kid uh it was called global warming and it was all about how we were going to be cooked by a certain year so when you look at the old claims of when we were all going to be microwaved by the sun and baked and turned into bacon uh the the dates are all wrong all of their predictions of doom and cataclysm have been completely wrong uh, and then we noticed into the late 90s and early 2000s it start started to take on a new pr campaign name known as climate change so because they couldn't convince everybody that we were all going to be cooked by a certain year it just became oh uh when when there's a storm when there's a, a when there's a uh, 
tsunami. This is just evidence. So basically every, anything and everything is evidence and proof of this amorphous thing, climate change. And then when you realize that the IPCC scientists, uh, you know, their, their emails got leaked and they were uh, scamming people and saying, let's fudge the data. You start to realize that this is a giant scam. And it really is just to, again, promote the exact same agenda. So like I said, in my lecture series, I go through a whole bunch of the globalist books. I mean, one of the, the key ones is Jacques Attali and his book, uh, uh, The Brief History of the Future. And he's, he's kind of like the Brzezinski or the Kissinger of France. Um, he mentors most of France's recent presidents. So he kind of is the shadow government guy in France, and he's on, on board with all the same guys that run our globalist shadow government. And he says in that book that the carbon tax is central to it, um, and really it's all about just controlling population again. So it's, it's a tax on life, and again, just a, a ver a, an extension of euthanasia. Absolutely. and because, so they, because they literally want to be able to say, like, at what point you, you, you need to die because you're using too much energy. And he makes that explicit statement in the book multiple times. Which is where our, our beliefs differ a little bit, I think maybe, because I mean, that's what I believe the mark or the, you know, when we do start implementing their technology into our body, um, seems to me they're gonna really want to have an off switch for us embedded into that. And um, that would make it a lot more easy for them to do, to pull the plug on those who are not lining up and uh, taking orders and whatnot. Yeah, well, certainly I would say that, that the idea of microchipping everyone is a satanically inspired plan. I just don't think that that's what John is referring to when he mentions uh, the number 666 because uh, there's a lot of theology that goes into that. And I actually have some lectures where I discuss that stuff. But we, we would definitely agree on the fact that, that the person or spirit behind these plans is definitely Satan. So it's absolutely satanic. And uh, um, there's no question about it. I mean, I, I remember learning about this when I was 18 and I, I told some friends about it uh, because I'd read some conspiracy books back then about whether they were going to put microchips in people and everybody was like, oh, that's crazy. And now it's in the news like every week. Uh, and, and it's actually the U.S. military that really experimented with this in the, in the first desert storm. That's when they really started testing microchips in troops. But they have been able to insert microchips into people for a long time, for many, many decades. Uh, it's just that rather that the technology has become more advanced, nanotechnology, these kinds of things make it make it more uh, applicable to various situations and mass uh, mass drugging. I mean, there, there are even drugs that are nanotech, basically. So, yes. yeah. So there's a lot yeah. of options. Yeah, go ahead. No, and I've I've come across some of those guys who already have multiple chips in their body. And so mm -hmm. when you sign up for the the armed forces, you're yeah. basically, you know saying my body is your body do it it is though the state owns you yeah yeah um so you know one thing that's kind of hard about talking about these sorts of things and i'm sure you have few people you can relate with in the world because it really narrows down you know how many people even have a clue of what's going on and when you do start trying to tell them these things the cognitive dissonance just it's just too much you know they people sort of i believe impose their own goodness their own way of seeing what they would do in a situation onto the people that run Absolutely. things and it just doesn't add up and they'll never understand uh, never but i mean all things are being revealed now um but you know one thing that's a bummer about this in some ways is when you people do seem to want to know and they are in their gut i mean and i believe our we're spoken to through our or conscience and that is a, a part of God within us and when we're feeling something's not right and then they you start telling them what it's really about and they're just like oh you know they're just like what do, what is what's the point of going on like they're we're never gonna beat them and so I guess that's what I want to segue into like do you have any suggestions of how people can effectively oppose this on a local level? I mean, I know some people have stood up against the Agenda 21 in their local community, and it's yeah. difficult because they've got people that are trained to sniff out the the ones that are not going along with it and to ostracize them. And I don't know if you, I had a targeted individual uh, piece recently, and that happens to these people, but I'm all about solutions if we can, you know, do you have any practical solutions about how people can effectively oppose this on their local level in their own towns? Yeah, well, if it starts with uh, changing on an individual level, it starts with, um, in my view, I'm an Orthodox Christian, so I believe Orthodox Christianity is the best way to 
uh, be legitimately linked into being connected to God. Um, it's not to say that I don't appreciate or learn from other uh, groups that are Christian, but um, that's what I would say is number one. That's a big part of my channel is devoted to that, that uh, theological tradition. Um, but I would say on, a, on another sense, a personal level, you know, education is number one, learning these things, trying to ferret out the true from the false. It also helps to be grounded in basic logic. So you know how to sniff out uh, fallacies, bad argumentations, and, and, and lies, because a lot of what we get in the media is propaganda. So it, it's really helpful to be able to have discernment to know when something's true and when something's false. So basic logic and these, these kinds of things, that's what I discuss a lot at my site. Um, I certainly support all the ideas of uh, not giving your money to any globalist entities, not supporting the big box stores, uh, support local stuff, support organic stuff. Uh, those are all crucial because when you go to these big box stores and when you support uh, you know, big studios, these kinds of things with your, with your movie tickets, you're really just feeding into that system. They're, they're, they're sucking away your time and your money and your energy. And you're being um, programmed by their agenda. And you're being programmed and, and your children are being programmed, especially by these, these uh, big entities. So th that's all number one. So I, I don't, I mean, I'm not saying you can't be politically active, um, but I think that, that in my view, the personal theological transformation comes first and then that kind of flows out into your, your family and your friends. Absolutely. And your, Absolutely. Your, then politics will, will change down the road, but not uh, politics is not first. And, and you're not going to learn discernment, the gift of discernment through your community course or through your elementary school or high school or college. It's going to give you the opposite of that. So discernment is so key. Um, right. One way that I see people caught up in the dialectic of um, is, is the right versus left paradigm. I mean, that's huge. And um, it's a huge way that, that, that they're dividing us and getting us pointing our fingers at each other rather than um, who controlled the whole system, who created the whole system. And a lot of people would say, oh, well, Trump is against the UN and, you know, he's got all these big plans. I mean, but it seems obvious to me that this is beyond pies, uh, bipartisan politics. This is, this is both sides moving towards it. Do you see Trump being able to effectively stand against this one? Uh, not really, just because, uh, you know, if we read somebody like Carol Quigley, the, the office of the presidency, it has a lot of power in the sense of being a focal point of people's attention, but in actually changing things or, you know, it doesn't do a whole lot. Um, so really what we've seen with Trump is just kind of uh, a lot of putting the same neocons into power that he was supposed to drain from the swamp that's the worst part of it. But at the same time, he's also done some good things. He's shaken things up. He's challenged the PC narrative and all that, which is good. So, but I don't put a whole lot of hope in, in just some white knight savior like Trump. No, it's going to take, uh, you know, a, a large scale alteration of how people view their own lives and, you know, a, a kind of revival in a way. Uh, I don't. I don't want to sound too cheeseball, but I mean that's kind of that's kind of what what's necessary. It's not going to be Trump. It's not going to be some neo from the Matrix coming and saving us. It's going to be individuals uh, changing and returning to God, basically. Amen. And having the boundaries and to say, you know, we're not crossing that line. Sorry, no, yeah. that's that's the line I'm not ever going to have crossed and these vaccines 89 vaccines they're having put into children now um, or they come take your kids if you don't do what they want all you got to do is look at the sky and see the nanoparticulates that are coming down out there it seems every system is in is putting metal into us and i can't help but think that plays into the uh uh, well, the electromagnetic fields that they're tampering with mm -hmm. and the 5G and all that. So, I mean, they definitely got a big plan. We can't trust one side or the other. It's all about that discernment you talked about. But what, another thing that I think is really interesting about the sort of dismantling of all semblance of trust and order of the political world, I think um, that's a part of the plan too, because mm -hmm. what is technocracy, but it's taking it away from the political side and saying we right. need to trust the scientists, right? The experts, yeah. They're, they're going to say, you know, politics is broken. It's yeah. broken on purpose. They broke it. They, they created it to be broken, right? Yes, absolutely. And so I was interesting because I, I haven't been involved in paying attention to politics pretty much ever until this most recent 
run through because it seems so incredibly different and the propaganda seems so obvious that I started paying attention. But one thing I noticed with the Bernie Sanders piece was they had him at like, for the first time I'm watching a president's debate talking openly about corruption. I'm like, wow, I don't remember that happening so in your face before now. We kind of like pretend like that's not happening. But it seems to me this, this everyone's having an affair, which, you know, in truth probably happened all along, right? But now they're showing the brokenness of the system. They're mm -hmm. showing us how awful things are so that everyone becomes anti-politics and they'll get sick right. and tired of them and say, hey, let's try the technocratic way. You know, it's, it's the experts. It's the one who really, you know, know their field. Um, which kind of reminds me of the Protocols of Zion. I, I don't remember hearing you mention that. I, I don't really think the Jews wrote it, but I think it was probably written by the Jesuits. Um, but the elders, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, where you remember, have you read that one? Mm -hmm. So in the end, it says they will start to show their own hand and they will start to turn their own agents in for being the, as corrupt as they are so that people will say, okay, I can't take this anymore. Give us something new. Yeah, that's that's um, part of the the tactics of of bringing in the technocracy is absolutely to reveal your hand, absolutely to break down the existing structures. So uh, the, the the globalists are not strictly speaking classical Marxists, but they do share a lot of similarities to Marxism. They're actually a combination between Marxists and capitalists, believe it or not. That's really the globalist plan. That's that's Fabian socialism is is, is a technocratic model for slowly implement, implementing this over a long period of time. And one of the things that, that Marxism is good for is um, wrecking and destroying everything that came before. So there's this, this, this continual critique uh, and, and de deconstruction and demolition of everything that came before, and that's central to what the globalists do. So absolutely, you're absolutely right. And, and in order to install a new system, you have to really convince everybody that the, the that they need a new system, that the old one's broken, it didn't work, um, it was already rigged to begin with. Uh, so let's just let the managerial experts control everything. And that's actually a central chapter in Carol Quigley's giant treatise on the New World Order from, from their side. He's writing that book as one of the, the proponents of it. And he actually says that, that the old systems will have to break down because we'll be run by experts and they know what they're doing and we just have to listen to what they say and if they say that you need to die when you're 30 then we have to do it if they say that we have to accept abortion because of uh sustainable development in terms of population control we have to do it if they say that uh your kids can be 60 different genders we have to do it if they say you have to take 60 different vaccines by the age of three you have to do it um yeah, because so they're the a, experts and they know better. <laughs> yeah, but but why are they the experts? Because they said so. I mean, it's like yeah. very circular here. But well, that's sort of what be became this really big flag for me about Elon Musk. Um, I I know people in my own personal circle uh, that literally worship the guy. They think he can do no wrong. I mean, I'm familiar with these. Um, people who are handed businesses on a silver platter and mm -hmm. know, as long as they go along with what the elites that are pulling their strings say, they can be the big, you know, admired CEO guy that started all this in his mom's garage or whatever. Yeah, right. I felt like that was him from the beginning, but I couldn't really prove it. And I'm finding some information to back that up, but it's just amazing to me. And it's fun to be able to talk to you because you have so many areas of expertise that tie all this together. But it's, it's amazing to me how they so effectively brand him as being cautious because you see he's this concerned fellow human being, which is why they gave him an electric car company, a solar panel company, and, you know, all these companies that, you know, reflect his values for the, for the planet. And mm -hmm. he keeps saying he's leery of technology. They see, keep playing that worn out clip of him saying, oh, don't unleash the demon with AI. We should be very careful about artificial intelligence. I mean, with artificial intelligence, we are summoning the demon. You know, you know all those stories where there's the guy with the pentagram and the holy water, and he's like, yeah, you sure you can control the demon? <laughs> then work out. They just believe he's careful, even though his solution is a brain mesh interface. That's what I was going to say, is that, that he, sa he says all this, and a lot of people think, oh, he's like a champion of something, like human rights or something. But then... Yeah, he goes, he comes along and says, oh, but here's a better way to do it where, you know, this will be the good version of transhumanism, wink, wink. 
but it's just, it's incredible that people just, they believe him and that they, they don't, we don't anymore even look at what the Bible would call the fruit of what a person is. We mm -hmm. just believe what the labels interpretation of that person are, regardless of what they're actually doing. And that's they the must- the power of the media and propaganda. And that's exactly what Brzezinski <laughs> said it would do. But just about to say, they must be very, very thrilled with the effectiveness of their control of the media, news, and Hollywood, and how well it has worked to program right. us. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Edward Bernays, of course, you know, the, the father of propaganda. Um, I did a lecture on his, his uh, famous book, Propaganda. He said that Hollywood was the greatest tool the world's ever seen for propaganda. So Hollywood, they've known for a long time back in his day, right, that, that it was the great tool for manipulating people and basically, in a way, inducting them. It's almost like black magic. It's a way to voodoo spell everybody with giving them a worldview and they don't even realize it. So you're actually being given your own uh, lenses by which you re read the world through movies and fiction and you don't even realize it until hopefully you know, you're older, you start picking up on things that don't make sense and contradictions and you start to, you know, hopefully become more wise in your, the way that you view the world. But for most people, unfortunately, yeah, it's a very, they're very easily programmed. They react emotionally. Uh, and that's why movies are very good at pulling the heartstrings and getting us to believe things that we normally wouldn't believe because we identify with the characters in the film. It just still kind of blows my mind and they know how to pull our strings they know how to literally rewire our thinking because mm -hmm. most people are going along thinking, Hey, yeah, I mean, I, I'm the creator of my own thoughts. You did. I didn't, you know, they'll, they'll argue with you about the, the points they saw on Fox news as their, as their backup. And they literally think it's their own ideas. It's wild. It's pretty wild. But anyway, I, again, I, I've uh, taken too much of your time on this topic already. I really appreciate your time tonight. It's such a pleasure to get your insight on these little known topics. So thank you for your work in exposing these deceptions. And again, thanks for joining us today. I hope you can come back again soon. Well, thank you. To check out Jay's work, please visit jaysanalysis.com for his insightful and in-depth analysis on Hollywood, geopolitics, espionage, philosophy, and more.